so the question here is, can you, um, what do you think uh, people working for Kodak should have done differently? And this is from Frank as well. Oh, hey, Frank, <laughs> we should get you on the screen here. Um, <laughs> anyway, uh, Kodak. So I have to tell you a very personal story. So um, my, my dad worked at Kodak um, for many, many years and um, had a whole group of contemporaries. So my dad is um, a world-class, what was a world-class um, selenium tellurium organic chemist. That was his passion. And um, and he's got, he has over a hundred patents to his name. I mean, you know, super brilliant guy. And he belonged to this whole cadre of, of, of scientists and people that work together and people that solve these really, really thorny technological problems. Um, and just last weekend, uh, they had a bit of a reunion uh, and I was invited because part of the agenda was they were gonna talk about my dad who unfortunately passed away early this year, but they were gonna tell stories about him and talk about him and, and sort of share tales. And of course, these are all guys who were in the R&D group at Kodak. And Oh, I've got to write this up because the stories they told about the inventions that were in the labs, the, the breakthroughs that they had made, the, you know, they invented color copying before it was even a thing, right? They invented, um, uh, they invented breakthroughs around a uh, uh, transmission of, of digital signals that, that nobody could match. And they, as they described it, they said, you know, we'd invent this stuff in the labs and we could see. Like we could see how this was going to break through these barriers, how it could create an inflection point where it would go. And we'd go to headquarters and they'd say things like, well, what, there's no market for that. And they'd go, all right, that's the point. There's no market for it. And, and headquarters would be like, well, we can't sell something. How do we tell our sales force to sell something into a market that doesn't exist? Um, and, and so it was just this you know, vision for the future, this kind of entrepreneurial breaking through those barriers, crossing the barren territory and figuring out how to make it go absolutely meets, you know, Kodak Liferdom at headquarters and they just wouldn't go for it. Um, and there was a great story, Ron, you'll appreciate this one, um, which they told at, at the time of uh, there was the Olympics, which was in, I guess it must've been in Tokyo. And the Olympic committee was uh, asking for sponsorship. And what they were looking for was about $4 billion. And Kodak said, no, no, we've got the big brand. You know, we're, we're, we're not going for it. We'll give you two. And uh, Fujifilm, uh, which at the time did not have much of a brand name, did not have much of a presence, you know, in, in ordinary people's imagination. Fujifilm said, we'll give you three and a half. So the Olympic Committee went with Fuji. Of course, this is a global event, right? And Kodak's attitude was, well, fine, you know, we'll, we're Kodak, we can live without you. But what that did was it opened the world's eyes to the fact that Fuji even existed. And it created the inroads through which Fuji was able to establish global partnerships and become in many parts of the world, in the heyday of film, a near equal to Kodak in, in, in terms of revenue and, and scope. And then of course, Fuji was a lot smarter about getting into digital than, than Kodak was. Kodak was afraid of it. Yeah. Um, you know, the, the Kodak people- They also <laughs> developed um, much more affordable mini labs. So in the early days of mini labs, the Kodak mini lab was say $100,000 and Fuji was forty. <laughs> So it's really interesting. There's an interesting little question. I think it's a great blog for you, Rita, is like, why did Kodak not become 3M? Why did 3M become this innovation factory, this mining company, um, when Kodak had these great scientists and they did not? There's some reason for that that, mm -hmm. that I think is very interesting. Yeah, and it's also interesting that like today we tend to lay the blame at, oh, economic short-termism and income inequality and stock buybacks. and. Yeah. None of that was there in Kodak's, you know, period of, of glory and its period of decline and fall. So it, there's a different explanation. And I think it really does come down to um, a couple of things. You know, the mindset of people running organizations, it, you know, is often totally inimical to the mindset required to run something that's new. And I think what happened at Kodak was you had a, a whole thermal layer of managers who just you know, you have a product with 65% profit margins and you've dominated that for decades and you get really, really good at what I call the exploit part of the product life cycle. Um, and what I would argue is we need to build organizations today that are good at the innovation growth, uncharted waters, let's create the breakthroughs, let's do that entrepreneurial thing. So that's where new advantages come from. Yes, you've got to have people that are great at running the thing. I mean, that's obvious that yeah, that's where you get your returns. But then you've got to have people who are good at that transformation and change thing. Because if you think about innovation as coming in waves, 
you know, what was innovation becomes exploitation, becomes transformation. And I think the leaders of the future are going to need to get really good at, at all of that. And that's actually one of the reasons I'm so excited to be working with Ron, because I know a lot about that first part. That's where I've spent my, my whole life is, you know, unicorns and fairy dust and let's invent the next big thing. <laughs> I'm a lot less experienced when it comes to, okay, that was great. That thing is now, you know, heading heading stage left. What what do we do with the company at that point? And Ron's had a tremendous amount of experience at that. So it's it's been really interesting to bounce perspectives off each other as we build this set of offerings. Uh so there's some questions here from uh, Frank as well. We should have him as a panelist. Um, <laughs> I don't think I've ever met Frank. <laughs> uh, I really like this fireside concept. Why one demand uh, oriented, focused on questions. Thank you. Uh, driven by great technology such as Zoom, YouTube, Instagram, Twitter. Question, can you uh, relate please changes hey, Frank. happening and oh, we're adding Frank. <laughs> you can add Frank, why not? He's a very little fireside learning education to your early learning model. I, this is a great question, Frank, because Rita um, talks about this all the time as it relates to Columbia and executive education and everything happening in the digital space. So, hi, Frank. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to the panel. I, 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 put him, I put him on the spot. I don't think he knew he was going to get promoted to panelist. <laughs> we're, we're, we're lucky he's not sitting in uh, you know his, his bathroom or his swimming pool or something. <laughs> <laughs> he did have the right to decline he didn't have to accept it. yeah he did not have to accept that's true you can't force him into the panel but. yeah so let's talk about education and um i'll talk about something that we've done at columbia which i think is pretty forward thinking and then something i'm working on you know just aside from that um so at columbia you know so here we were february of 2020 and you know looking at I don't know, $19 million worth of business, right? That which we booked basically, because our, our, the in-person exec ad market is a really long cycle market. Uh, and that just went poof. <laughs> and so after about two weeks of sort of saying, what do we do? I, I, I sat down with our dean and I said, look, I, you know, people are not going to stop needing to learn and executives are not going to stop needing to be developed. And this is going to be a need there. We've just got to figure out some different way of doing it. So what we pivoted to was what we're calling live online. And uh, so it's this kind of format, actually, very discussion oriented with, um, you know, the usual cast of professors. And we learned a bunch of things. So one of the things we learned was that there's an absolute hunger for it. Second thing we learned was that um, that that we broadened the, 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 the population of people that could that we could serve, you know, that could come and join us because it didn't matter if you were in Hong Kong or Malaysia or Nigeria or wherever, you could dial in as long as you had an internet connection, which even then was a little dicey for some folks. We had people on the phone, you know, <laughs> there was a big wind. <laughs> Um, so we learned we could reach a lot more people. We also learned that we could experiment with different formats. So rather than everybody comes to New York and we hang out for three days and you know, it's fire hose. Um, for example, with um, one of my courses, um, I extended it over a number of weeks. And so it was less intense during the week, but spread out longer. So you could actually take the concepts and apply them and then come back and talk about what you did and ask questions about what you were learning. So it integrated the learning much more with people's work. And I actually think that model is going to continue even once we're able to have in-person classes again, because I think it meets a different need, you know, that, that, that learners have. So let me talk a little bit about um, what, what I'm working on. And it's a concept that really is about, uh, so, so give a little bit of context. So we have a, a, a technology we're working on. It's software, but don't, don't think of it as a software offering. It's basically a guide. It, it's sort of a spine to let's say learning something new. And it takes you through a series of checkpoints and the idea would be that, let's say one of the checkpoints is figuring out customer segmentation. Um, well, let's say you don't know anything about customer segmentation, or the last time you had it was in your MBA program 15 years ago, and you were still doing four Ps for marketing, um, and you really want to get up to speed on it. Well, the sort of existing approaches would say, oh, go off to Columbia, get on a plane, sit in our classroom, learn what you can, and go back and try to figure it out when you get back home. So my, my thought, and this is really the whole Valise concept, right, is how do I bring this to the organization so that people can benefit from it where they are? You know, they don't have to go somewhere. And so the idea is you'd be hitting this, this part of the system, which sort of says, you know, customer segmentation, click here, and it takes you to an inventory of learning resources, some of which are going to be 
you know, little short videos, maybe recordings of something, some of which are going to be downloadable. You know, here's a checklist. Here's a form. Here's a video of Rita actually doing a customer interview. Here's the five things to avoid when you're doing a customer interview. So it allows you in, you know, an hour sort of format to get smarter about that. Then you come back and you do the work and then you kind of iterate backwards and forwards, between what you need to learn. And then maybe, maybe down the road, there'll be like a badging function where I could say, hey, you know, Frank, took the module, answered the quiz. He's now a level five, you know, competent person. And so late you know, down the road, when I'm thinking about who do I staff on a venture or who do I pull together to work on a transformation project or who I can now see what course they've taken, you know, what skill they've exhibited, what measures they are. And so it gives me that level of, wow, you know, this person I might not have thought about because they weren't in my circle of people. Uh, and I can now reach out and, and pull them into this project that I'm working on. I also think that could be great for, for example, for the diversity agenda, because a lot of times we, know, we have this human natural tendency to connect to the people that we know, but there may be very capable people who we don't know, but who have the skills that we need. And so wouldn't it be cool if we could see that across our organization? So that's what we're working on. And I'm, I'm, as you can tell, I'm really excited about it, but it's this idea of learning. I mean, and I still think there'll be a role for executive education in it from an education point of view, but I think this idea of learning when you need to, as you need to, in a structured way, I think that's got a very powerful alternative approach. So what are you thinking about uh, financing? I see this this uh, fireside chat is great, but you know it's free. And how how, how do you, how do you make it work? Do you have sponsors, or um, when when learning becomes more you know integrated, we can easily how do we work out new financing models in education that work for everyone? Yeah, so Frank, I think when you when you accepted the the panelists, we build your visa card two thousand dollars. So thank you. <laughs> Talk about hardball, Ron. Jeez, you're going to freak people out. <laughs> now, what we're thinking about doing is, um, if you think about the funds that are available, let's say for innovation, you know, there'll be some kind of project budget. And right now, if you wanted to buy tools, right? So you wanted to subscribe to IdeaScale or you wanted to get a piece of software that helps you do, I don't know, whatever. Um, I think there'll be a budget, something like that, right? And my guess is some of it will come out of the consulting budget. You know, the, the, like, so let's just make this up. So let's say you came to Ron and myself and you said, I've got this pro program. I want to figure out what haptic technology means for the future of holography. We'd be like, okay. <laughs> so, um, and, and in, you know, we'd re I'd really like you guys to work with it, work with me on doing that. So what we could do is just say, okay, you know, here's like a consulting fee for that, that project. Um, we'll set it up in a six month period. If you're happy with how it's going, you know, we'll, continue. If you're not, we stop. Uh, but I think it'll be finance, something like that. I think it'll be more of a services model is my guess. But then there's also going to be a lot of free stuff around it, right? You know, because part of my role in life is to do research and discover new things. And, and so I could imagine there'll be a free layer, which anybody can tap into. And then if you want more hands-on, more intensive help, then th there'll be a paid layer. Similar to, right, I'd say, um, I'll, 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 the analogy I'll draw is to when I give speeches and stuff, right? Um, some of it's free. <laughs> this is not for charge. And some of it's expensive because you're having an event or you're having people or you want your senior leadership team uh, to do it. So I think it'll be something like that. In, in relating to that, um, uh, Marianne had a question about entrepreneurial growth in innovation in the area of professional services, which I think is a related to kind of where Frank's going, because obviously what we do is professional service. Um, I can start on this, Rita, and give you my yeah. views. And, uh, but I, I, I think what's happened with the pandemic has really been um, a massive opportunity for innovation and professional services. So there's a, there's a group that I've been associated with called the Chameleon Collective, for example. And they were a virtual and still are a virtual um, marketing company. Um, and um, they don't have an office anywhere in the world. They have, I think, over 200 uh, employees now in their business. I, I can't give you the numbers because they're a private company, but the, their business exploded during the pandemic because things like Zoom and, and digital conferences and, um, you know, companies figuring out that, um, and Rita and I are associated with another services company that has figured out that their clients has figured out that you don't have to fly somebody to their office every week to have them do coding. They can actually do coding from anywhere on the planet. So their costs have dropped dramatically. Their business is up and their profit is way up. And the people using these digital tools 
and frankly, the cultural adaptation of the tools, right? So I don't have to be sitting. Uh, my daughter is going to work for a major global bank this summer. She graduated from Villanova University. Thank you very much. Magna cum laude. Thank you very much. <laughs> and um, yeah, she did very well. She's never met anyone at the bank. She did her internship last summer virtual. She did all her interviews this year virtual. She starts, I think, next week virtual. She may not even meet a person at the bank until January of next year. So the world has changed. And how you, you know, if you think about a Japanese bank thinking, oh, I don't have to meet you to hire you, having grown up at a Japanese company, I can tell you that's amazing, <laughs> right? So the world in services is changing uh uh, Marianne, uh, quite uh, dramatically. And Rita, I don't know if you want to add to that. Or Frank, well, you can add to that, Joe. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll <laughs> chime in, and, and Frank may have a perspective as well. Um, I mean, the fact that Flaminia is here is a, a great gift yep. uh, of great the pandemic example. to me. I mean, my, you know, I'm always traveling. In the pre, pre times, I would always be traveling. I would be in my New York office, you know, once every couple of weeks. I'd be on site, you know, teaching or working with clients. Um, and so I could never have an intern because for many years, the presumption of sponsoring an intern was you'd be there and they'd be with you and you'd, you know, they'd, they'd watch what you did and they got to sit in on meetings and all that stuff. Um, and so uh, Flaminia's sister actually, who happened to be studying with someone who I guess is a, a fan of mine, um, just wrote to me out of the blue and said, would I, would I have an internship? And I wrote her back and I said, look, you look terrifically well qualified. I'd love to, but I, you know, understand I don't have an office and I don't have any of the normal things interns expect. And she said, oh, that's all right. I'll be spending the summer in Italy. <laughs> I was like done. <laughs> and then uh, Flaminia uh, is her sister. And uh, so the two of them worked uh, over the summer and uh, Flaminia has now joined us full time, but we've never met in person. We've met <laughs> Zoom like, but you know, that kind of unlocking of talent, if you think about it, that that's unprecedented. The, the fact that you can make these connections and leverage those resources. Um, and, you know, clearly I'm not watching over her shoulder with a stopwatch wondering what she's doing because, you know, one of us is asleep <laughs> during at least part of the other's working hours. So it just doesn't, doesn't, I, it, it, it's a whole new model for how we, we do things. So, um, so Rita, we have about nine minutes. Okay. So I'll encourage anybody else in the chat, if you have any uh, follow-on questions, if, please drop them in there. You, um, we can post our um, contact info again. I guess I'll put, it in, I'll put it in the chat so people can grab it in case mm -hmm. they want to reach out after this. Um, so Ron, um, a couple of things I do want to talk about a little bit on this theme of time zero, because um, we've been talking to a lot of smart people about what comes next. And we may be past the pandemic, but let's remember people have been at home you know, out of the company of other human beings in many, many cases for a long time. Now we're going to go out, no masks, in contact with everybody and their germs in a joyous celebration of life. But, you know, the flu has not gone away. <laughs> other infectious diseases have not gone away. The cold season, which was very mild this past year, has not gone away. And so even if it's not coronavirus, I think we can anticipate that there are going to be, you know, serious health issues that become apparent uh, once we're all back to, you know, socializing and being in person. And, you know, and, and masks have become sort of, in some places, really socially unacceptable. You're treated as weird if you wear one, not in, lot, not in par parts of the world, but in parts of the world, you really are. And I'm actually thinking, you know, it has been so nice not to have my annual kind of three days in bed with a flu kind of experience that I have every year. Because, you know, when you travel a lot and you're on airplanes a lot and you're in airports a lot, you're going to get something. It's just a matter of time. And so, you know, maybe maybe there is a population like that that's going to take more precautions as we go forward. So I'll be interested to see how that plays out. I'm thinking, you know, how I'm, I've talked to so many people that really liked working at home mm -hmm. and they found they could do more focused, concentrated work, and they, they would not get disturbed, and they could make their, you know, family life also work better. So I'm thinking, you know, how many offices do we need? Um, are we going back to this, uh, to this, you know, offices, uh, open offices, or what are we, what are we doing? Well, that's the big question. And, you know, I have seen every variety of hypothesis that I can imagine on that. So we're seeing some CEOs, um, 
uh, Jamie Dimon uh, of J.P. Morgan Chase, the people at Goldman Sachs, basically saying, absolutely not. We're done with this work at home thing. We need everybody in the office. And we're also seeing the whole backlash. There are there were several articles in, in both The Wall Street Journal and The Times talking about how for a lot of people, they're like, uh, no. And there was a great profile of a young woman who was told, you know, had to be in the office, really important meeting. So gets up early, drops her child at daycare, you know, does the hair, the makeup, the whole thing, you know, puts on the business suit, drives to the office for a meeting that lasted exactly six minutes. And she said, that was it. That was it. I handed in my papers that afternoon. (laughs) I found another job that would do remote and I'm gone. I'm out of there. So I think this unrealistic expectation, not this expectation that is born from a time when you had a very different way of managing people um, is going to be really different. And people that grew up digital, you know, as, as a younger friend of mine said to me, look, <laughs> I can understand why the partners want to be, you know, in the office it's because they're in meetings all day long and where they want to be able to schmooze with the client and go and have lunch down the hall and, you know, everything. I said, the rest of us, we're putting together PowerPoint decks all day long. You know, I sit in the office with my headphones on. Why do I need to be there? <laughs> I can do PowerPoint decks here just as easily as I can do it there. So th- there's this fascinating kind of tension about what is work and what is creative work. Um, I do think there's something about human contact. And Ron, I'd love you to weigh in on this because you've experimented with all kinds of flavors of this. Um, is, um, you know, this ability to build trust and to really be together, together sort of in the trenches. And when you're there all night, you get the deliverable just over the finish line right before the deadline. And there's something exhilarating and very human about that. Um, I don't know if that can be replicated virtually. Maybe it can. Um, I do know that, that it's, it's, it's important to build trusting relationships for certain kinds of really complex problem solving. Yeah, I think that's true. I think what's going to happen truly. And I, and it's interesting that the, the people playing the most brass knuckle kind of tactics are in the financial services industry. Shocking, right? So I, I think the answer is going to be yes. It's going to be both. So I, you know, I, I think about some of the the events. You know, if I go way back uh, when we were doing our transformation and turn around at Brookstone, one of the things that we found out was that the website provider that we had was you want to talk about time zero. Um, basically, on July one was going to close the doors, and we found this out in January ish, and so we had to you know you know, buy ATG and code a, a very complex, very large website in a matter of three or four months. And it turned into a 24 hour day, seven day a week kind of thing where, you know, I as a CEO would, you know, show up at three o'clock in the morning with a stack of pizzas. Um, and I think it, it was transformational for the, for the company on a, on a number of, uh, in a number of ways, but nobody wants to live like that. I mean, those people literally had to have a month off after that to just find their families and, and be human again. Um, and I think that's kind of what um, one of my sons went to work for one of the largest global banks right out of Boston College. And I said, if you take the job, you have to take it for two years and you know you're in the worst industry with the worst company. So don't come to me and tell me you want to quit in six months. And six months into it, he said, this is the most miserable place I've ever worked in my life. We made him stay two years. He kept his commitment. Now he's started his own business and he's very successful. And he and a bunch of his friends started a business in July of last year. They, they don't have an office. They don't meet their clients in person. It's all on Zoom. Um, they're starting now to go out and, and be in the physical world. But I, I think it's going to be both. I think it's an and. Um, because you do need, you know, we are the creatures that pick the, the shiny pebble from the stream. We're very tribal. We're very tactical, tactile. Um, um, but we also want to be in our cave once in a while and be left in it. And I think it's going to be both. Yeah, I think the hardest thing to navigate is going to be um, this hybrid, right? And it's like, I mean, we've experimented with this already with teaching. Like, I can optimize teaching for screen. You know, there's ways we can get people engaged and have conversations and be invested in each other. And I can optimize teaching in the classroom. I mean, that's easy. I've done that all my life. Um, It is impossible to get a really fulfilling experience if you're trying to do both. And a lot of of universities are doing this where they'll have like 25% of the students in the class because the students want it. 
right? They, they want to be with each other. That's what they want. <laughs> the professor is just kind of, you know, the proximate cause for us being in this room together, but we want to be in the room together. And so I think, you know, we're learning a lot of interesting things about what works and what doesn't. Um, this is this is great. So Ron, um, folks that want to know more, uh, get to know us where, you know, we, our emails are in the chat. If you want to know more about what we're doing, if you want to understand more about what we're building at Belize, I'll talk to anybody who will listen to me. <laughs> Because it's been a long time. I mean, I've been working on this now for five years and have not found the formula yet. Uh, so we're working on it. Um, but, you know, it's coming along. And, and I think there are some really nice tools that are being built that I think could be really helpful. And we're trying to make it back to your question, Rank, about, about economics. We're trying to make it accessible, you know, at one end and then, you know, more bespoke for those that need or want a more intensive level of help. And I think that's what we're working on now. Yep. And so the whole purpose of Belize is to take Rita's brilliant com concepts that uh, from end of competitive advantage, discovery, of and growth, seeing around corners and, and uh, use some of my experience and other people's experience as well to bring them out and solve real problems for real people in the real world. And we're very, we're doing some of that and it's a, a lot of fun. So uh, if you want to talk more about that, our contact info is in there. We're out there on the web. It'd be hard not to find Rita. She's <laughs> like, uh, you don't, it's not a blind squirrel and acorn thing. She's everywhere. So you can find her on the internet uh, if you need her and we'd be happy to help you if you, uh, if you need our help. That's great. Hey, this is terrific. Um, alignment of culture in hybrid work and organizations. Um, so Bogdan, I'll answer that one quickly. And then I think we need to respect people's time and let, let folks get back to their day. This has been fun though. We should do these more often. <laughs> sure, we should do this every once in a while. This yeah. is great. Yeah, so just we can have guest that. hosts like Frank come on. <laughs> <laughs> totally. <laughs> now that we know him, you know, so we'll get to know you virtually, Frank, and we'll build up trust, you know, and then you can be part of the happy tribe. Um, so, Bogdan, um, I'd like to go back to some work that was done uh, at MIT by a guy named David uh, Allen. And he was interested in studying the research productivity of researchers. And the thing he was interested in was how much information gets shared by these people. And one of his independent variables was how far away from one another were they sitting? Interesting. It shows you what professors get up to, right? But what he found was a super interesting graph. So if you imagine the vertical dimension is information richness. So how much information got shared and processed and used and how much did they bounce ideas off each other? And the horizontal dimension was how far apart they were sitting from each other, physically sitting at work. Um, and he found a line that kind of went like this, like this, like this, very rich, very rich, very rich, and then fell off a cliff. And what he concluded was that by the time you have a group that is literally sitting more than 60 feet, about 20 meters apart, the, the flow of information just comes to a choke point. And so the conclusion from that study, and that was done years ago, is if you're sitting more than 60 feet from another person, you have to be much more intentional about the communications. So Bogdan, to come to your question, I think you need to work on it. And it takes a lot, culture kind of happens if you're hanging around the office. I mean, one of, one of our clients said it to us that she's working on an innovation program. And she said, you know, we're all sitting together. So we all knew what was going on. Now, every day is a meeting, <laughs> right? And so when you're together, there's just this natural flow. But when you're farther apart, you have to be much more intentional. So you have to structure things like, let's have a cultural conversation. You have to structure things like, for today, we're going to go around the room and we're going to talk about early warnings. We're going to talk about, you know, um, how do we handle it when one member of the team can't be part of a call that's scheduled for whatever reason? You know, do we record it and then they catch up later? Do we say, no, 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 we have all got to be. And how are we going to do this? And, and I think you have to be much more explicit and intentional if you're building a hybrid culture. I'll leave you with a great example that you should look up. Um, so there's a company called Buffer, which is one of my all time favorite startup stories. And Buffer was started virtual, went to sort of in-person, found that that cut them off from a lot of would-be talent and created all kinds of problems. So then they went hybrid and then they abandoned hybrid. They said, it's just too difficult. Like we can optimize for virtual, that works great. We can optimize for in-person, that works great. The hybrid thing is just, it's just causing so much extra work. It's just not worth it. And I thought that was interesting. So they are, they have a very active blog. Um, their CEO is a, a great guy and is very open about the decisions he makes as a manager. So the company's buffer, look them up. Um, I think you'll find them really interesting. 
Well, so thank you, everybody. This has really been fun. Thank you, Ron, for jumping in at the last minute. And Flaminia, um, enjoy your birthday and have a great time in Tuscany. And uh, we'll see you all next week. Uh, next thank week's you. fireside you. is, uh, is um, David Duncan from Innocites going to talk about why customers should not be a mystery. So thanks, Ron. Thanks, everybody. This is great.